if you're trying to do something bold and different the chance of you getting trolled is high obviously spent huge sums of money on that campaign and had to take it down within i think 24 hours or so it was something like that i can't remember ultimately when it comes to marketing you're selling a product um and if you're not able to track how you're you know driving that impact then it's not a campaign then it's not marketing it's just sure. content for creative satisfaction how do i distribute this to the widest audience right. so i need a face that gen z relates to Welcome to Why Leadership Fails, a podcast where there is no typical gyan, no stereotypical tales of glory. Instead, we bring to you unscripted and unfiltered conversations about real-life experiences of leaders navigating challenges, embracing failures, and redefining success. I am your host, Bhavna Lal Chandani, VP Digital Business at Hindustan Times. Well, whether you're a seasoned marketer or someone who's transitioning into the world of marketing. This episode is just for you. Stay with us as we discuss the landscape of marketing and also explore the nuances of career transitions. Today we have with us an award-winning marketer who started her career in journalism and went on to lead marketing for successful companies such as Vice Media, Duolingo, Netflix and others. She has worked on successful projects like Money Heist, Delhi Crime, Stranger Things, etc. Let's welcome Miss Tara Kapoor. Hi Bhavna. Hi Thanks Tara. Thanks so much for having me. Lovely to have you here. <laughs> It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So Tara starting with your career journey, right? It's pretty intriguing. Well, you started off with journalism, went on to marketing, and without a typical MBA in marketing. How did you really steer the entire shift and you know what led you to a marketing role particularly in companies like Netflix and uh, you know Vice Media etc. Yeah, I think um what's interesting actually is is there's a lot of parallels between journalism and marketing, right? I mean, ultimately it's all about your audience and who you're speaking to and finding insights, right? So when you're creating an article or writing a story or, you know, shooting a video, um ultimately you need to identify a peg. Um and your peg, if you look at it in marketing lang- uh, language would be your insight, right? And that's sort of what you build your your campaign around. Um so I think just that mindset of being able to find an angle or an insight came from journalism right mm-hmm. you know the way you do your research you do consumer um you find your consumer insights you speak to people you interview them and then you gather that information and create a story out of it right so i think um interestingly enough journalism kind of set that base for me um it gave me an ability to tell stories and and build out you know narratives for content and ultimately all marketing is content right so sure. um i think that set the base for me and then um ultimately when i worked as a journalist i was uh in i was working on a show called brand equity which was a marketing mm-hmm. and advertising show and through my conversations and interviews with people that was my mba you know so for me that was my crash course that's where i kind of learned um everything that i know about the industry and and what works what doesn't work um uh and and i got to ask the hard questions and you know kind of hear what people had to say and um that was sort of my my learning and at some point i realized i don't want to report i want to be the person people are talking to and, and you know creating the stories that people want to talk about and sure. that's kind of when i worked work towards making that transition awesome super but you know whenever there is a certain transition that happens right whether it's from one industry to the other or one role to the n- another there's always some kind of a challenge that one faces there are setbacks that happen so and working in a you know global streaming giant like netflix you know which of course had came with its own share of challenges um you know it led to a lot of growth driven decisions that you probably had to make so how did you ra- uh, navigate those challenges and were there any specific obstacles that you would like to share with us yeah absolutely i think um you know when you just look at a resume you just see the success and you just see the journey where where it looks like okay somebody's moved from journalism and then has worked at Netflix Duolingo etc right but um there was a lot of setback in that process you know when i was a journalist i believed i could shift to the other side of the table and i could be a marketer but not many other people believe that right because my entire career was built 
as a journalist and um uh you know when there's no it's kind of like that chicken and egg situation where it's like sure. until you do the job nobody's going to hire you and until somebody hires you you can't do the job right and um that was hard you know so when i was trying to transition i went through a whole series of applications i don't know how many resumes i sent out how many rejections i got and um it was disheartening you know after a point um i i think i believed in myself and i did believe in myself because finally i got to where i wanted to be but um you know it's hard to go through a series of rejections and and sort of feel like uh you're trying to do something and nobody is willing to take that chance on you and uh the the positive is eventually somebody did right and sure. um you know before i got to the global companies i spent a sizable amount of my career at a you know a content studio that was coming up a digital content studio called supari studios mm-hmm. and for me that was where i built my career you know that was where i spent about almost four and a half five years um and that was where the proof of the pudding was you know kind of put together i worked with some of the top brands developed their campaigns for them on the agency side and you know that's where i honed my creative skills was doing a lot of production um understood more nuance of storytelling because you know from journalism you went from doing 3 minute stories to a 30 second ad spot right and you wanted to land a message in in, in that much time and uh, that was very transformative for me and from there is where the the other opportunities sort of started coming up because then i had a strong portfolio of work um and then i you know got my first opportunity at vice and i think from there it sort of became easier but that initial period of making that pivot was was supremely difficult um not going to lie about that it was wasn't easy absolutely nothing comes easy for that matter <laughs> and you know pretty much i think it's a story of grit determination and passion you know while i hear you speak right now <laughs> uh so you know you've been involved in a lot of iconic projects right marketing a lot of them is there any specific project per se that you feel has left you know a legacy um you know and if you could just highlight a little bit about it and why is it so special yeah i think for me um my favorite campaign that i worked on was money heist and i think it's you know the the fun thing about marketing a show like that is the show itself already had a legacy you know and you're sort of just celebrating it it was just a hat tip to the show um but what i loved about that campaign is we made a spanish show feel desi and i think yes. to do that was was really special to me because um it was the final season it was sort of a hat tip to a fantastic show that indians fell in love with during a really tough time you know with with the pandemic um and it was something that really entertained the masses you know and uh when you think of it as a show it does have a bollywood kind of formula to it you know just in terms of the romance the action the yeah. the music all of it you know it sort of was this celebration and i think that's what worked um that's why it worked in india um and we just wanted to kind of push that forward right so bella chao became jaldi aao and you know it sort of moved from there and we added a whole bunch of local languages and um i th- i think it was just super fun for us and uh, we had fun our agency partners had fun and i think that came out uh, in the campaign itself and it was also a long campaign because it was a split season you know so the first episodes went out in september and the final episodes went out in december right so there was a long period to kind of stretch that message and create fandom and and i think we we managed to achieve that so that was a truly special campaign to me absolutely and very successful <laughs> you know in all sense So you know while we speak about the successful campaigns um in media and entertainment trolling is pretty much a part of it Absolutely So have you been a part of or any such campaign you know that you were involved in and you know has been a part of the trolling and how did you really um navigate through that as well Yeah and I think uh I think that's a part where sometimes marketers need to give themselves a little leeway because um especially like there's a really fine line between creating something iconic and creating something that's a disaster right because <laughs> when you do, when you're when you're trying to put out something with a point of view you're mm-hmm. taking a risk and risk and reward we we kind of know how that works right so um if you're if you're trying to do something bold and different the chance of you getting trolled is high but uh sometimes marketers really worry about that or they give themselves a really hard time when something go- goes wrong um and I remember one of my bosses used to say this to me all the time is remember you're not in the business of saving lives so take the chance okay. kind of push push the boundary a little more because what's the worst that will happen to you you'll get trolled the absolute worst is you 
could potentially lose your job, which is a, the part that gets a little more scary. But um, as long as you're able to learn from what you've put out um, and you've taken a risk and, you know, your leadership has aligned on it, the, your job is also probably protected in that process, right? And they'll yeah. probably reward you for taking a risk and taking a chance and trying something different. Um, so I'm digressing a little bit on your question, but I wanted to give that sure, context sure. first. Um, but so I had one of these experiences where um, I was working, again, I'm just going to use a Netflix example. I was working on Fabulous Lives of Bollywood Wives, mm. which, you know, is a binge-worthy reality show at the end of the day. But reality content is what people love to troll on. You know, it's pe- yeah. like people want to call it cringe. They want to call it whatever, but they all want to binge watch it, you know, at the same time. So um, we kind of wanted to embrace that, the fact mm. that people call it cringy. And we wanted to showcase that the Bollywood Wives are aware of it. You know, they know that people mm. are going to say stuff, but ultimately people want to watch them, right? And yeah. we tried to create an asset that in our mind was self-aware and was kind of mm. projecting Bollywood fab, you know? So it was like a song. It was kind of like cheesy. And, you know, we had... Um, yeah, we had all the top influencers like, yeah. you know, Kush- Kusha Kapila and, and uh, Dolly Singh and a whole bunch of them because they're also trolled in the same manner, right? So sure. the, the idea, w- like the intent of it and the insight of it was around being self-aware and being like, hey, whatever, you can say whatever you want, but we're celebrating being Bollywood fab, right? right. So um, I still personally like that asset a lot, but it was so severely trolled. Um, and when I look back on it, it's literally two or three tweaks that needed to happen because mm-hmm. I don't think people got that the intent was to be self-aware and laugh at ourselves, right? Sure. The intent was... Um, to kind of make a comedy asset out of it, but people took it seriously. Mm. And I think it just needed an like a little refinement to make that make the joke land better. You know, when you think of how jokes land, it's literally about a refinement of that final, you know, the punchline and how the punchline is delivered. Um so for us I think it, we were missing that punchline. You know, we were mm. missing that that way of really refining that that final part. And uh but ultimately it's out there. You know, people have have ripped it apart sure. and that was a couple of sleepless nights for me. But what I loved is eventually all the influencers called me up and they were like, by the way, whatever's happened, <laughs> we're used to this and we're happy we did it. You know, so I think Indeed. that that kind of made me feel a little better about it because that was the first time I've really faced that level of trolling. Oh. I mean, it wasn't obviously directed at me, but it was sure. it was just kind of uh, a bit of a shock. So uh, great, Tara. So if there was one thing, you know, that you had to redo again. Uh, with respect to this show, what would it be? Yeah, so I think for me in the asset, it was, you know, sometimes you need to break the fourth wall um, Mm. just to showcase that this was a spoof, right? So I just feel like in that asset itself, it just needed a little nuance towards the end where the four influencers or the Bollywood wives kind of just break the fourth wall and start laughing. Like, I think Mm. even that could have possibly established a punchline, like to showcase that, this wasn't something that we thought was a serious asset. We knew mm-hmm. we were just having some fun with it, right? So, I mean, that's a s- small example. I think something like that could have broken the the tension of the asset in some way or at least made it much more obvious that, mm. you know, this is a joke and this is a set or, you know, something like that. Like, um, it's it's like the intent of it was kind of trying to land what um, Schitt's Creek did with uh, mm. um, the I- uh, I'm Alexis song, you know, like mm. something like in that space was sure. kind of what the intent was. But... Um, that was so out there and, and in your face. I think we needed to push the boundary a little more like that. Sure. You know, so when you, I hear you speak, um, creativity, and in today's time, technology intervention is there. We have a lot of data that we are actually sitting on, AI coming into the picture. How do you really balance, you know, creativity along with the data-driven decision-making? I think it will always be a combination, like, what I love about marketing is it's art and science. And even for me, why I chose marketing as a career is because I have a creative side, but I also have a business side, you know, and my and my brain needs to balance both of those for, for me to be excited about anything that I'm doing, right? Mm. So um, I feel like that balance of your right and left side of your brain, the balance of science and art uh, is what creates compelling campaigns, right? Because ultimately, when it comes to marketing, you're selling a product. Um, and if you're not able to track how you're, you know, driving that impact, then it's not a campaign, then it's not marketing, it's just sure. content for creative satisfaction, right? Um, so I think you need to use data first to inform your insight. So the insight needs to come from somewhere. It can't just be, yeah. you know, something sitting in the back of your brain being like, I really want to do this. It has to have some backing for the audience you're trying to speak to. And then 
you need to use data and insights to also figure out how to distribute and how to send that out and put it in the world for the people that you're intending it to serve, right? Mm-hmm. And data, AI, technology, all of that helps support that ecosystem on both ends. And then your creativity is what your story is and how you're bringing an authentic voice to mm-hmm. it. And that is subjective. Um, and like I said, you need to take risks uh, to either get the reward, right? To, so if you need to get the reward, you need to take a risk. It can blow up in your face, even with all of that kind of coming together. Um, and like I said, in most places, it's probably just a tweak or it's really overthinking and then ripping the story apart, you know, mm. and, and it can happen either way when things go wrong. So um, and hindsight is twenty twenty, right? So you sure. you will look at something and be like, what were they thinking and how did they put that out? But when you go back to the process, you'll mm. realize that, you know, sometimes you've over analyzed something mm. and that's the problem. So um there's so many examples of of campaigns that were ridiculously long wrong huge sums of money were spent on them um and when you look at them as a stranger and a person who wasn't in the room and you want the the fly on the wall you're suddenly like what were they thinking like how did they how did this get greenlit at these mm. huge companies and then when you think of the process that a marketer would have gone through you realize that oh i can see where a simple idea suddenly went from room to room, mm. conversation to conversation, and then the core idea just got destroyed. And because they were just looking at it day in and day out, um, they didn't mm. have a, an outsider's perspective to tell them that you guys have kind of taken this to a level that doesn't make sense anymore, you know? so Like which one? Um, I think a great example, and actually I have a great example of something that did the same insight well and did the same inside badly awesome um and so the what i was thinking of was was pepsi's campaign around black lives matter mm. right where mm. they featured um kendall jenner mm. and you know obviously spent huge sums of money on that campaign and had oh. to take it down within i think 24 hours or so it was something like that i can't remember the exact time frame but when you look at that campaign you're mm. like what were these guys thinking but if you try to put on your marketer's hat and actually backtrack on what could have happened in that room and again I'm making assumptions because I wasn't in that room but um, uh, you would think that okay they're trying to do something that's very Gen Z mm. um, you know they want to capitalize on Kendall Jenner's fan fandom and the fact that she had such a huge base they're like oh it's a it's a timely period you know with moment marketing so to say sure. around Black Lives Matters Matter which obviously was the large mistake because mm. they were trying to market their product in in something that's a movement, right? Yeah. And it was inauthentic by the end of it. But when you think of the the process, it was, how do I distribute this to the widest audience? Mm. So I need a face that Gen Z relates to. But they've forgotten the core aspect of it is, what does Black Lives Matter stand for, right? And yeah. you can't replicate something and, and, and then have a Pepsi can in the middle of the ad, right? And that, that kind of, um, it's unfortunate because it could have possibly been a beautiful piece of content yeah. if if you when you think of the intent of it but mm. um ultimately somebody was like oh where's the product placement somebody was like mm. let's use a bigger star somebody was like um maybe we're trying to align with the wrong mission because black lives matter is current as a movement should we talk about that you know so when you hear yeah. all these pieces coming together in as individual pieces they kind of make sense but when you put it together Force it's fit. this yeah it's this phosphate kitchery yeah. that has happened right so um that's an example of where it went completely wrong uh the example of where the same storyline the same uh not storyline the same you know theme or time in history that they were covering was black lives matter was the nike campaign with yeah. colin kaepernick and again they had backlash but mm. their story was authentic they stood by a, a you know an athlete who was dreaming crazy they didn't force fit their product in that narrative, but they said we support athletes who, uh. who, who dream crazy, and that's been the core of Nike's identity ever since they've kind of put out their right. content, right? So pretty seamless. Yeah, they weren't doing something that was yeah. uh, out of the box or inauthentic to them as their brand or their storytelling. And after that backlash, they got the support, and their stock rose, and you know it was just this amazing marketing story that played out. And again had it to the people in in the room who would have seen their stock crashing would have seen the hate in the in and the trolling mm. but been like guys hold on there's something else that's buzzing 
there is a positive narrative that's building out and we want to be on the right side of history, right? You know, that's what, what they right. sort of said uh, in, in that narrative and that's what worked for them. And as marketers, they took a decision to look at the data, but not look at the mass volume of trolling, mm. but look at that positive sentiment that was starting sure. to grow slowly and yeah. and make a decision that worked, you know, in their favor. It's still a controversial ad at the end True. of the day. But, but I think, you know, same, exact same narrative in yes. some ways but just told so differently and um ultimately brands also have to be authentic to what they're standing for you can't one Absolutely. day talk about black lives matter and the next day talk about pride and the next day talk about something else and expect people to yeah. think that what you're saying is is authentic and something the brand truly True. values um so i think that's the hard part to juggle as as a marketer oh that's a brilliant example i would say uh, well, speaking about, you know, wearing a marketer's hat, right? And talking about your career stint, which is the current one at Duolingo. You come from a media and entertainment space, have handled marketing for Netflix, and now you're leading marketing for Duolingo, which is a, a language learning app, you know, in the education space. So talking about marketing strategies, is there something that you apply successfully from one sector to another? Or, you know, it's probably a unique framework altogether for each of these. Yeah, so for me, I I don't even market the, the language app. I'm marketing the Duolingo English test, which is a high stakes proficiency test, right? So it's even harder into education than the language app is More itself. Niche. Yeah, and it's it's focused on study abroad. It's it's like the IELTS or TOEFL. Um, but ultimately, for me, I'm speaking to a very similar audience, right? So for entertainment, you're also speaking to the large young population that exists in, in sure. India. But with the Duolingo English test, I'm speaking to them at a very specific time, right? So one is through that mass or larger base, I'm trying to identify the two to three million students that are in, or actually slightly larger than that. I would say about five million students who are intending to study abroad mm -hmm. um, or at least have some interest um, to study abroad. That's like finding a needle in the haystack, right? In Given yeah. our population. But I need to look at the same touch points. So ultimately... Social media is important. Influences are important. Mm. Uh, colleges are important. You know, just being where students are is is the way to sort of communicate to them. But for me, I need to speak to them at the moment when they're slightly more serious. When it comes to entertainment, you're kind of looking at uh, trying to fill the gaps wherever somebody's bored and your objective is to entertain them yeah. in any shape or form, um, which happens at multiple touch, touch points in a day. For education, you want that quiet time. You want that time when they're searching they're serious they're so seo is important you yeah. know different factors matter the influences they're following for a more serious learning perspective you know you kind of need to switch around what you're doing but the broad formula is pretty much the same sure. um and for me the challenge is super different right so i moved from a well-established company in india so netflix was very set up and, and established and had a large team um to a, a another global company but one that's much smaller in the market right now. It's growing. It's massive opportunity. And um, the challenge for me was a larger business one. And mm. like I said, my creative and business brain keep battling yeah. with each other. So for me, Netflix was a really rewarding creative job and Duolingo is a very challenging business-oriented role. So um, I don't know what happens next, but you know, <laughs> I like that juggle with, with both sides of my brain kind of operating. Sure. Interesting. Interesting. And you know, when we speak about audience, right? So I think... In fact, Richard Branson did mention that success is about listening to customers. And we pretty much believe so, um, not just about listening to customers. In fact, we get audiences voice, you know, in this conversation. Uh -huh. So we move into this segment called Janta Unfiltered, where we bring in queries from audiences and put it forth to our guest as is, you know, because this podcast is all about unfiltered conversation. So there is no filtering. I'm going to read the question to you as is. And, you know, let's see how you awesome. can answer them. Excited Great. To, to hear it. <laughs> Great. So here we have a question, Tara, from Meher from Delhi. Well, I think she's pretty much read our minds, you know, when we just had this last discussion. So she says, you have worked with global companies like Vice Media, Netflix, and have pretty much cracked the marketing code at the large organizations. Do you think you're currently acing it and able to crack the startup code at Duolingo? Or will you pivot back to what you were doing at some point? The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a really hard one because one is, I don't think I've cracked any code. I think it's kind of just going with 
what your audience is telling you and you know i think that's that's the the crux of it right like the more you listen the more you learn and then you take that learning and try to apply it to whatever you're doing tomorrow something might go wrong like we said we're taking risks here right so you never know what's going to happen sure. and um uh yeah i don't think anyone's cracked anything because you never know where things are going to move next right um the marketers 30 years ago didn't know social media existed right because it it yeah. didn't exist and you know now 90% of our marketing campaigns are built on social media and okay i'm exaggerating with the number but you you get where i'm coming sure. from right and we're already seeing that um transition happen with ai as well i don't know where ai is going to go tomorrow i might be replaced by a robot you know who <laughs> who can create a formulaic campaign and then sort of push it out right so um where things go i don't know i might go back i might not i might you know just stay here forever you know it just depends on on where my career takes me or and it's not just career right it's your life as well so it's kind Actually. of how do you balance everything and um there was a a really wonderful line that um uh, again i think it's like a motto to me that that really resonates with me which is you can have everything but not at the same time mm-hmm. so you know who knows what True. will happen and and when but for now just listening to my audience and figuring out where to where to go from there great so i think meher uh, thank you for sending in this question and i hope your query is addressed by tara thank you well you mentioned about balancing and i certainly feel that leaders uh, are allowed to have some fun as well we've had an interesting insightful conversation let's balance it with some fun <laughs> so we move into our next segment which is called 60 second spin it's all about being witty being fast i'm going to throw some questions at you and let's see how many you can answer within the 60 seconds oh my god i'm feeling stressed <laughs> well, you're coming on a spin with me you don't need to feel stressed <laughs> let's begin let's go last web series you binge watched um real women your last search on google oh uh, about the date of the kendall jenner campaign <laughs> <laughs> hashtag that represents your personal brand um open conversations it's what google. i sort of put up If you were a Netflix character, who would you be? Um it's a hard one. It would like I would love to say I would be like Tokyo or somebody like that, but I'm definitely <laughs> not like but that's what I would probably aspire to be. Uh I would say that I'm I'm like slightly clownish and clumsy, so in some ways I'm also Homer Simpson, so it's kind of like <laughs> a bit random. Uh but yeah, I would say Tokyo just to, just to feel good about myself. <laughs> awesome. Who's your inspiration and why? Um my sister uh i think in you know i say this quite often actually but uh i think she's just always been a role model for me throughout my my life from my childhood till you know till today uh and i think she's just done an incredible job of of balancing life you know her career being a mom being the tech industry uh you know being great to our family so so yeah it's so it's very close to home <laughs> that's great i think that's something which you know one should always have in as as an inspiration marketing superpower you wish you had i need to think about this one <laughs> but i think <laughs> sure. i think it's uh probably being able to to just like really just find the person you want to speak to you know and and being able to create a campaign that is unique but can speak to exactly that target audience which i i think is is the challenge right like there's there's no fixed formula to do that and i would love for everything i create to speak to exactly who i wanted to speak to which is impossible in this world of content but i strive i strive to get there <laughs> great last one preferred social media platform linkedin awesome great thank you so much you did well we and that's the end of the 60 second spin thank you i hope still, you had some fine stressed <laughs> <laughs> all right tara so with this uh, let's sum up with our last segment called the expert edge where i would like you to share a quick thought on why leadership fails and one mantra for being an effective leader Um I think one of the spaces where leadership fails is is through overthinking. Um mm. so I think sometimes and it, it's so hard to do, right? Is and it it's also so basic is sometimes you need to trust your gut. Um because your experience as well as your intuition can tell you something, you know, and it's very hard to do that professionally because you know it's the data it's the the information it's you know and sometimes there's an information overload you know so i think the hard part for leaders is to know when to look at the numbers and when mm. to take a punt because their gut is telling them something and i think that's super hard to do when it comes to leadership uh because 
you can't tell your boss hey i just had a feeling that i wanted to do this you know you still have to back it with something um but i think that's where i see a lot of things fall apart right some you know i i feel like that's what happened to the pepsi campaign mm. is people overthought the idea and they sort of ripped it apart because there were too many cooks there was too many thoughts and somebody's gut instinct did not you know they didn't act on it i'm sure mm. there was somebody who was like hey i'm not sure this is something we should put out at this time period mm. uh and they didn't react uh, on that gut instinct right so um that would be my biggest uh note is sometimes don't overthink and just go with it agreed let's not overthink and just go with it <laughs> yeah. so i think that's a brilliant suggestion thank you so much tara for being here it was completely a pleasure discussing with you getting insights and just having a random conversation and i hope you didn't get stressed out much about the 60 second spin <laughs> no thanks so much for having me and and you know that was fun i i just need to let my self go more often <laughs> great that's channel awesome. my tokyo <laughs> <laughs> channel your tokyo correct thanks a lot don't forget Your career journey is a narrative in the making. Each transition holds the potential for growth and learnings. I hope this episode sparked some valuable ideas for you. Please feel free to comment and share your thoughts on today's episode. We would love to hear from you. Buckle up for our next episode and stay tuned for a ride into the unexpected. Until then, all you leaders out there, keep slaying, keep inspiring and continue leading the way. This is me Bhavna Lal Chandani signing off.